Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger, and today's show features Wendy Kennedy. Wendy will be here. She's an intuitive and empath and a channel bringing in galactic wisdom for an earthly life. Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger podcast has won the COVR Award for Best Radio and Podcast Show. Walt Magazine named Dare to Dream as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. It's high-ranking self-improvement on Apple Podcasts, nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards and for a Webby Award. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness. They do energy work out in the world. If you want to be a facilitator or take one of their classes, go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I'm a media visibility specialist. I'm a book writing coach. I help you take your book from start to finish. And I run a twice a month Zoom group for all you amazing spiritual messengers and authors out there. I also have an independent company that takes your book to a guaranteed international best-selling status. And I do all the heavy lifting for the author. And finally, I am a publicist. I run a very boutique operation. I have about five clients at one time, getting them booked on radio and podcast. And I have a gift for you. If you are a spiritual messenger and you know you came here to shine your light at this really auspicious time, learn how to become more visible so you can get your message, your business, your being out there. Let me gift you with the how. Go to debbiedashinger.com slash gift. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. So today, Wendy Kennedy is here. She is a prominent channel and spiritual teacher. Wendy has used her gifts and abilities to communicate with higher dimensional beings for the past 28 years, assisting others in recognizing and releasing their patterns and limiting beliefs to create the foundation of a life filled with greater health and abundance, love and joy. She lectures and channels for clients globally. Wendy was one of six channels featured in the movie and book, Tuning In, Spirit Channelers in America. She is a featured guest in the docu-series, Interview with Extra Dimensionals with my buddy, Ruben Glangden, currently seen on Gaia TV. And Wendy's work can also be found in the book, The Great Human Potential, Walking in One's Own Light, which is now available in seven languages. You can learn more about her at higherfrequencies.net. And with that, I welcome Wendy Kennedy to Dare to Dream. It is so great to have you here. Hi, Debbie. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, I mentioned one book in your bio, but that's not true. <laughs> I think you've written quite a bit, haven't you? It's been a while, but no, that's the only published book. I feel like I've been doing this for so long, like I should have 20 million books, but um, no, there's just the one that's been published and that came out, I think, oh my goodness, uh, 20... Oh my gosh, 2014, maybe. I honestly can't keep track. And that's the one with Tom Kenyon? Correct. Okay, so I'm reading it and I don't even know the title. Oof. It's The Great Human Potential, Walking in One's Own Light. And it's a compilation of, of materials. It was um, published by Martine Vallée, who has since passed. And every year, for several years, she would pull material from several uh, different channeled authors. And I was fortunate enough to be able to do her last book. Yeah. And, you know, I was sharing with you before we started, I am reading the book. I love the book. I'm getting so much out of it. I'm actually, uh, you know, doing notes on my iPhone. And what I find amazing is it's evergreen information. This doesn't feel like whatever year, if you said 2014, it doesn't feel like that. It feels like right now, important, still learning, uh, still ascending, you know, in all these pieces that you channel in the book very powerful. What's interesting is that, you know, it's been 28 years since I've been working with the guys and their message really hasn't changed in all that time. It's the same thing over and over. It might be, you know, slightly different nuances to it, but the core of the message is the same. And it's always about empowerment and kind of looking inside 
and kind of looking at our programs, where's our frequency and helping us to begin to recognize and read all that subtle energy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You've been channeling for almost three decades. That's pretty amazing. And I heard that you had learned about channelings at some point in your life. And then you heard about it and you just knew in your bones, like, oh, I'm supposed to do this. That's a different story. So how did you break through? How did that happen where your abilities came online? Yeah. I mean, now looking back, I think things happened earlier than that, Mm. but Mm. around 1994, I started having some visions and they were very um, visceral. I mean, I could I could almost reach out and touch things. They were, they were almost that um, physical for me. And I didn't know what they were. And so I started doing some research, thinking maybe it was connected to the building that I was living in. And then I came across channeling and it was such a strong call for me. Um, you know, I had studied theater and film in school. So there was always a drive for me to understand what motivates us, you know, really what are our beliefs, which is the same work that I do with the guides. And it exposed me to meditation and yoga, body work, things that, you know, in the late eighties, early nineties, I would not have probably experienced in Kansas where I grew up. And so it was kind of a natural progression. I'd already been doing some internal work before I got to that point. And so I found a couple of books and, you know, there was just a little bit out there. It was kind of the beginning when channels were coming out in a bigger way. And um, I had one tiny little book and for years I couldn't find it. And I just met someone at uh, the Gaia Channeling Conference who came up and wanted me to sign her book. And it was the book that I used. So I actually have a photograph. I'll have to go back and look and find out what it is because it was an obscure book. Mm. And then um, Sanaya Roman's Opening to Channel, which I think is a classic. I used that and I did some of the exercises. And, you know, I my eyes would flutter and and I would tingle, but I couldn't get the words out. And then finally one day, Um, I knew I was supposed to have pen and paper and I started doing automatic writing. And then as time went on, probably nine months or so, I was hearing the words well in in advance of writing them. And they said, just put down the pen. And at that point, when I did that, that's when my primary guides that I work with, with the public came in the ninth dimensional Pleiadian collective. Oh my gosh. I love that. I relate Um, By the way, I also was a theater major. I majored at USC um, in dramatic arts. I did that professionally for a long time. And it is a very interesting perspective, I think, to come from that. And then also how you described that uh, was very well done, that you had this moment where it seemed like you began this whole path, but in fact, there were these other seeds and reference points that had occurred before that. I'm very much that with UFO. It looks like what happened to her? She was a skeptic and, you know, and an eye roller yeah. and all of a sudden she woke, but it's, you know, it's not, it is that, but I also had these things that happened before that moment when I went truth, done, truth. Yeah. So they were being planted for me and by me probably. And you mentioned the nine Ps. So let's talk about that for anyone who doesn't know. I think a lot of people do know you, but this ninth dimensional Pleiadian collective or the nine Ps as you call them, uh, what is their energy like for you? How do you experience it? And are you still present when they're speaking through you? I am present. It's a bit like a lucid dream for me. So I'm conscious of what's being said in the moment, but it will fade pretty quickly. So like tonight, when I think back, I might have a few ideas of what we covered, but when we get down to the nitty gritty of what they said, it it, it goes really fast. Um, so I am conscious of that. And um, a lot of people will describe them as as kind of being a wise old friend. Um, the Hawaiians that uh, experience her, they call they call them Auntie P. So uh, you know, they said it, if it's too much for you to think of us as a collective of about twenty five hundred beings of light, which is what they are, they said just think of us as as one, Mrs. P. You know, or the P's as it kind of evolved into, and. Uh, you know, they don't incarnate 
to a planet the way that we do, but rather they align with the blueprint or the mission of a star. And in their case, it's Alcyone, which is one of the central stars in the Pleiades star system. And that particular star is a repository for information. So uh, it's like a library. So we are kind of the paperback version. Mother Earth is a library for all of the experiences of all life on her. And then all that information is transmitted to our sun and all the information for our solar system is stored there. And then all the solar systems in the galaxy send the information to Alcyone. And so the guides are record keepers. They're also keepers of frequency and, and they kind of moderate timelines just to make sure that there is no manipulation of what we think of as timelines. We don't really have specific timelines because the past, present and future, they're all going on right now. And we kind of string now moments together and we give ourselves the illusion of time, but they kind of monitor that to make sure there's no corruption of frequency. And so they're here really to assist us, to help us to remember our history and to help help us to feel empowered so that we can step into our stewardship of the planet. So, you know, they're, um, their family of, so, you know, so thank you what, for hearing that question because yeah. we share genetics. Yes. We share DNA. Yes. yes. They are progenitors for us. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people, especially if you're, you're drawn to the peas, there is an aspect of yourself that has spent time in the Pleiades star system. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and we'll go through different phases where, we'll feel aligned with a particular star system. We'll think, oh, I must be from there. But then you might need a different lesson. There may be archetypal patterns that another system holds and all of a sudden you might be drawn to Sirius or Orion. Um, so, you know, we get around as souls, but um, if you feel drawn to it, know that there is probably an aspect of your soul that is there. Wow. Wouldn't that be a class? Galactic archetypes. Whew. Um, I'm down for it. I want to go over well, actually, a few things. You we've do done it. it. We've done it. And you know what? It was one of those that I felt Who like I want to bring it back around because we've got seven major star systems that we must closely align with. And it's the archetypal patterns from those seven systems. So maybe when we get to late 2024, 25, maybe I'll bring that back around. I'm in. <laughs> John, I think that would be an amazing thing to investigate and experience. Yes. Wow great minds. You're just you in the future. And I'm still in the past thinking what a great course that would be. <laughs> when you said sun, so they're, they're, the information's going to the sun. You reminded me of something, you know, that I'm hearing lately about sun codes, uh, sun gazing, that it is good for us to spend a little time probably without contacts to absorb some of the sun at a particular time of the day because we can receive codes and downloads from them. Is that accurate? Is that part of what you're saying? Whatever goes there can also come back here? Yes. Yeah, so even just to be out in the sun and to receive that, that, um, the warmth and the photonic energy that's coming from the sun as we absorb it, we're, we're getting information. We're constantly receiving information from the sun. Same thing for Mother Earth, where we're receiving constant information uh, that tells us where we should be resonating and, and helps us to stay connected with all life on the planet. Have the peas given you, Wendy, any indication of when they're going to come visit? Specifically, I know they've been visiting, but I mean undeniable open contact. I know it's upon us. Um, and uh, have, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they're not big on predictions, but they have been talking about it lately in terms of 2026. Okay. Um, that they're, and maybe this is something you can um, ask them about in a little more detail, but uh, they say that the probability is quite high in 2026. You know, I think oftentimes we think, you know, Pleiadians, they must be the blonde haired Nordics, or, um, you know, there are just a few species that are hanging out, watching what we're doing, the reptilians or the Zetas, but it's actually quite vast with lots of different species. And the group that I with, like I said, the group that I work with, they are non-physical. So they don't really, they don't have crafts. They, they don't 
show up in physical form. They just appear as light. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, some of these more dense beings um, have kind of given an ultimatum, you know, you have to the governments of the world, you have an opportunity to kind of bring this information out in the way that you want to bring it out to the public, or we're going to do it for you. Because I think what happens here is we go through the ascension process as we increase our resonance, mm -hmm. um, will impact the entire universe. It'll have a ripple effect because earth is a grand experiment. Mm -hmm. We have genetic material from thousands of worlds. And so as we learn and we grow that information, because we're holographic and fractal in nature is sent off to all of those species and it can create a massive shift in the universe. So that's why there's so many beings who are interested in what's going on here right now. And especially as we learn to access deeper levels of compassion that in and of itself, they say, is the gift that we have to share with the universe. Mm, I love that. Yes. And you just said something that concurs with something that Bashar said, specific date, 2026. So I love that we're narrowing in on that. And I also want to check in with you. And I want to ask you, Wendy Kennedy, like, what are you doing in the world right now? What are you up to? What has changed for you in what you're doing or being out in the world at this time? In terms of work? Um, yeah, but anything. I mean, I think it's a really interesting time to be alive. And I also, you know, want to give you some focus and some shine as well. Well, I think my life has kind of shifted more from my work, which is where it's been for the better part of two decades, to more very ordinary, very grounded, mm -hmm. um, kind of very human stuff as I've been dealing with aging parents and um, just moves across the country and, um, you know, just a new phase in my life. And so it's been very, very human stuff, looking at my own patterns of beliefs and, and really using the tools that the guides have given me over the, the years. Um, but in terms of work itself, even that has shifted a little bit. Um, they're certainly preparing me for something. I'm not quite sure what. Um, things are opening up. So uh, my focus is kind of because the last two years have really been on family. It's kind of coming back to work a bit more. Um, and I know there's a new guide waiting for me, um, but it hasn't been the right time to fully connect with that new guide. And I know there's new information that will come with that guide. Um, the peace will always be with me and I'll always be channeling the peace, but the language of light is also a big part of the work that we've been doing for really the last, I don't know, even sure how long it's been eight years, I think maybe was something I started doing very early on when I was channeling and then kind of put it aside when the peas came in and the guide said, it's time to bring it back. So I do the, I speak the language of light and I actually write it. I create mm. what I call galactic light codes. Mm. Um, and all the, all the frequencies are encoded in the symbols. So that's become a huge thing because it's a piece of spiritual technology and it is something that we can utilize to help us align with higher resonances. Mm -hmm. Wow. Amazing. Um, I love the light language myself. I think it's, you know, one doesn't even need to understand what's being said, but we understand, you know, on an energetic level, you can absolutely feel it. And I also really like that these beings use tones, they use sounds that resonate at a cellular level. I feel like I, I sing, I do, um, it depends, whatever, you know, we open up for workshops, we do festivals, we do medicine ceremonies, all sorts of stuff. But I feel like there is a frequency that occurs when we do the music we do when I sing, that definitely creates some of that. So I love that that's part of your work. Yeah, you know, and I think it's something that a lot of channels do. I don't think they always call it out hmm. because people ask, well, why is their voice different? And really, it's just elongated vowels that they can utilize. Um, they can modulate the frequency in because as Americans, we have very short vowels most of the time. Or if you look at British uh, English, it has uh, longer vowels, so they can do more with those with the with the open uh, tones there. 
That's so interesting. Okay. Never thought about that. Yeah. Well, um, and it's beautiful that there's many different ways people can receive, right? It's like um, not multimedia, but, you know, multi uh, faceted the way that you can deliver through the writing, through the, the channeling, through the tones, through the singing, through the light language. It's like, it's really nice, really nice. And um, for the human, humankind, I thank you for all the different ways you disseminate to us. And if you're comfortable to start now, I would love to invite uh, the Pleiadians, the ninth dimensional Pleiadians collective that you work with, or the nine P's or anti P to come in now. Sure. So, um, like I said, uh, they are working with tone and sound. So it's as if you're getting a healing today. So you want to make sure you drink plenty of water over the next several days, just to help move the energy through the body. So, uh, I'll get out of the way and we'll see where we go. Ah, yes. Hello, dears. This is the Ninth Dimensional Pleiadian Collective, and it is a pleasure and an honor to have the opportunity to connect with you. So we know there's a lot of ground that you're going to want to cover, um, but uh, let's just start here. Um, we want to talk very briefly, and then we'll dive right into your questions. And we want to remind you that you are in the driver's seat of your reality. You are not at the mercy of the collective. So if you want to feel joy, happiness, peace, abundance, that is all within your realm of creation. It is something that you can certainly do for yourself. That doesn't mean that the collective isn't going through a challenging time. It doesn't mean that there might not be some mm, challenges around you, but that doesn't have to be the frequency that you hold. You can open up in any environment to the higher frequencies. It's a choice. The external does not determine how you feel inside. It is your choice first to hold a frequency, to pulse it out, and then it is reflected back to you. What happens very often is that you'll hold a frequency, you'll pulse it out, and it will reinforce the frequency that you're already holding, you just think that the external came first and then the internal. You're forgetting that it started first on the inside. So as you go through the coming days and there may be things that mm, will say a show, uh, there will be a narrative that goes on in terms of things that are going on in the world. It may trigger some fears for you. And if it does, pay attention to that. It just shows you what programs need to be integrated, what fears need to be released. Um, but know that uh, it doesn't have to be your reality. You all can choose something different in this moment rather than go into a fearful state. You can choose the state of peace and just imagine what that would feel like. Sometimes if you say, I am peaceful, the inner critic might get a little busy in the background and say, mm, no, not so much. Uh, feeling a bit irritable, a bit antsy. Um, you might be able to hold that statement for about three or four seconds and then the inner critic starts. But if you say, I wonder what it would feel like to be peaceful, then you can align with the frequency and the ego is not triggered. So whether you say, I am this thing or I wonder what it would feel like to be this thing and you immerse yourself in the frequency of it, the energy of it, both will align you with the frequency. So that's something that you can do on a regular basis. You can check in with yourselves to say, where am I vibrating? Oh, you know, today I thought I'd work on peace, but I'm certainly not feeling that. So time to come back to that, that sensation within me. And then a couple hours later, check in again. All right, I am feeling peaceful. Great. Let's just reinforce that and imagine it a bit more. And then a couple hours later, oh, fell out of that frequency. I'm irritated by my boss. All right. So back to this peaceful state. So it's a practice and we invite all of you to develop a practice for yourself of checking in where are you vibrating? All right. So that's our bit here at the beginning. Where, where would you like us to go? Thank you so much and welcome. It's beautiful to hang out with you, spend time with you and I just want to reiterate something you said. I thought that was very important for anybody who tries to use something affirmative and feels they're not in alignment with it. So instead to ask, <clears throat> I wonder what it would feel like to be peaceful, to be joyous, to be abundant, to be in love, et cetera. So I wonder what it would feel like to be. 
And the, the first question I have for you, Pease, is I understand based on what I'm hearing that undeniable first contact will be occurring on Earth and the Pleiadians, because we share so much genetically and look wise, you may be the first race we meet. And my question is, as Pleiadians, is that so? And if so, what can we do to prepare for open contact with you? How can we, humanity, bring up our individual and our collective vibrations and frequencies way up so we can be with you, meet with you? So in terms of who it will be, it's not set. It's possible. It will be Pleiadian energies, uh, Pleiadian beings. But in terms of your preparation, you know, as above, so below. So any of the fears that you may have about making contact, you've got the same fear here, human to human. So as you deal with your fear programs in terms of what's going on in your day-to-day -day life and what's happening in your reality, that will prepare you for interdimensional contact. That will help you to stand in your power because, you know, many of us have been present for, for decades just kind of watching to see what um, you're doing, helping in subtle ways in the background, because for most of you, and certainly at the collective level, if we just showed up, it would generate way too much fear for you. And that defeats the purpose. We want to help you to feel empowered. We want you to stand in your personal power. And this is a big issue. It's what's been going on for thousands of years in your uh, current reality. You've been abdicating your power to a few and they've taken that power and they've run with it. They've created a reality for you. And so now you're learning to question. You're learning to um, really look at where your judgments are, releasing those judgments and coming back to your own perspective of self as an aspect of the divine. You are a divine being of light having this physical experience. So as you just simply deal with your stuff as a human, then you will be prepared for interdimensional contact. Now you might say, well, okay, peace. What does that mean? Deal with my stuff. Every single moment shows you how you are expressing or suppressing your divine light. Absolutely every single moment. So if you're not in flow, chances are you're suppressing energy. Most of the time when you are not holding a judgment, things are flowing very easily. You don't even stop to think about what it is that you're creating. You're just present in the moment, going moment to moment to moment to moment. It's only when things stop flowing that it gets your attention. And things stop flowing because the moment that you judge something as being good, bad, right, or wrong, you, in essence, cut off half of the flow of source energy because that thing that you are judging is source energy. And you want to make yourself separate from it. And the universe says, well, that's not your true divine nature. And we need to reflect that back to you so that you can see that, so that you can come back into wholeness, into your divine state. And so that thing that you judge, you will keep creating it and have it reflected back to you in your reality until you let go of the judgment of it. And it's not that you necessarily want to endorse that frequency. You don't necessarily need to live in that frequency, but what you have to do is acknowledge it as being a valid frequency. There are lots of unsavory things going on on your planet at this moment. And it's a valid exploration of frequency. It doesn't mean that it's one that you want to lend your energy to. And the, that's very different than judging it as being good, bad, right, or wrong. Because as a being of light, you wanted to go down and explore all the subtle nuances of creation. And sometimes, unless you go into the very dark places, you don't really recognize the fullness and the richness of the light. You need that contrast. And this is why duality is so exciting to the soul because it gives you something to contrast and compare. So when all is light, it, it, it's all very similar. Uh, so to the soul, it's exciting to go down and play in the dark for a little bit. And this is what you did. You said, well, can we come down in density, forget who we are, 
and then work our way back up again. And that is the game that you're playing in. And this is not a beginner's game. This is a game of mastery. And you've been around the block a few times before you got here to planet Earth. At least most of you have been down here in density before. There are a few souls on your planet, not a huge number, but a few who've never been in density before who wanted to lend their energy. Um, and that purity of uh, a soul who hasn't come down yet and hasn't um, acquired so many experiences in density, but there are a few, but not as many as you might think. But most of you have been around the block a bit. So kind of to bring it back around, um, it is letting go of those fear programs. The most important thing for you in any given moment is what is showing up for you in this now moment. You might be asking for something that's really big, something fabulous that you want to create, don't be frustrated if it's not showing up. Pay attention to what is showing up because that is showing you what needs to be integrated to elevate yourself to that high resonance of what it is that you want. So you're a vibrational match for it. Use the now moment. That will help you grow very, very quickly. And as you do that, you stand in your power and you'll be ready for your interdimensional experiences. Mm -hmm. So we do pay attention. We make a a big dream, a big desire, wish to the universe and our guides and our higher self. And then something else shows up. We pay attention to what shows up that's begging to be noticed and healed. And you mentioned to integrate that. How do you suggest we do that? What is the protocol to integrate things that maybe we don't prefer, but they're there? It is simply the acknowledgement that it's valid. It is a valid exploration of frequency. So mm -hmm. if there are other people involved, you might need to work with forgiveness, forgiving yourself, forgiving other people. Um, you can also process emotion. If you're sitting in emotions that are very uncomfortable, it is observing where they physically sit in the body. Oh, my body is contracted. Uh, my lower back is tense. I feel hot or you might feel cold, tingly, uh, contracted. Uh, it's, it's just simply observing without judgment. And then you can give the emotional label. Maybe you're feeling uh, annoyance, which is different than frustration or anger. Um, and then what's happening in the mind? Is the mind quiet? Is it active? If it's active, what's the quality of thought? And just observe without judgment. And the longest that most of you can do that is about 45 seconds. If you are staying in that energy longer, it's probably because you've gotten lost in the story of it. Uh, we just want you to observe without judgment. And as you observe, what happens is the non-judgment allows the energy to flow again. It stopped flowing the moment that you held judgment. Mm -hmm. It was stopped in its tracks. And it may be something that, it may be a frequency that you started holding as a baby. Uh, I'm not supported. Maybe your parents didn't come running when you cried and needed support. And so you initiated that program. I'm not supported. And then again, at five and six and then 15 and 30, and every single incident of it has been stuffed down. And when you observe and you open it up, it's like a, a vibrational lock and key. You have opened the doorway for that same frequency with different mass to it. It might look different on the surface, but the vibrational essence is the same. You allow every every experience of that to flow again, to release it. So that is how you release. it. simply releasing judgment and allowing the energy to continue on its journey. Mm -hmm. So assuming you will be here uh, within you know, a matter of years, not many here, and that it will be the Pleiadians who have open contact with humanity first. How will you arrive on earth? How will you connect with us, talk to us? What will you exchange with us? Well, most likely it will be a number of ships all at once. It will be a coordinated effort around the planet and the message will be the same. Um, you know, welcome to the galaxy, basically. <laughs> um, because it, when this happens, it is an absolute shift. Uh, it's a paradigm shift. Uh, your belief systems will forever be shattered. They will not be the same because the first question you have is about energy. How did you get here? All right. And that will radically alter your energy systems on the planet. And the petty things that you all focus on or have been conditioned to focus on, because honestly, there is so much social conditioning that if you were left 
to your own devices without these control mechanisms in place, you'd come back into natural harmony. But you are constantly being bombarded with um, with what we would call uh, conditioning programs. From 2019 to 2026, we call that period in the future when looking back, it's frequency wars. You are in the middle of a frequency war. There are beings who are vying for control of the way that you think, the way that you feel, and your physical body. All right. So uh, you're coming to the end of that. You all are seeing it now when you are looking at your governments and you're seeing that those institutions aren't operating in the way that serves the collective. It's only serving a few. Things are broken. It's not working any longer. Uh, you're starting to question some of the stories that you've been told. And so it, it will have a ripple effect. There are enough of you that are starting to wake up. Um, so when beings do show up, it shifts your point of focus immediately. And you can kind of get a sense of what that is like because you all went through that in 2020, all right, when um, when you were told COVID existed and it radically shifted things overnight when you had lockdowns and everything else. And so it will be as you go here, it will be a quick and radical shift in the way that you exist. Will it be telepathy? telepathy how we communicate or otherwise um we're not sure because it depends on who shows up um some of you will receive telepathic messages because at that point when a few beings uh, ships show up in the sky it kind of opens the, <laughs> opens the way for everybody to kind of show up so some of you may have telepathic messages from other beings um, that you may have worked with in other lifetimes, that there may be an aspect of your soul that is from that system. And so it, it when you hear that there are other beings out there, it kind of opens all of your energetic centers. And so they will take the opportunity to say hello. So it will not just be the Pleiadians. They may be the ones that will take point with ships in the sky, but many of you at that point will start communicating with your uh, galactic family and stellar beings who are there to be of support to you. So um, it, it it's all hands on deck at that point, shall we say? Yes, love it. Okay. And what can I do? What can I, Debbie, do to assist and open the gateways for you, peas, and for this to occur in my lifetime? How can I show up? And I mean this earnestly and sincerely. Well, you're already doing it. You're allowing us a platform and, you know, a way for us to communicate to people. So it's one thing when you receive messages from us energetically, you know, um, it doesn't threaten your belief systems in the same way as an ET standing right in front of you that you could reach out and touch. So um, there's still a part of you in your mind that can say, well, you know, it resonates with me. Uh, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. There's still some question there in the background. And so you can allow the information to kind of come in without it shattering your your paradigm. Um, and like we said, it's very different when they're in your face where you can touch them, feel them, smell them. It's very, very different. So you're helping us to prepare the way for, for others to welcome that energy in. And we know a lot of you say, well, I'm ready now. I want to connect with physical beings now, but we would say for a great many of you, even those that think that they want that connection, there's still a lot of fear programs that are running um, and it can bring up a lot of fear and safety issues. So what you're going through right now in terms of the threat of nuclear war that's kind of out there in the ethers, it brings up your safety issues. So a lot of what's going on with the collective is actually helping to prepare you to heal some of those fear programs, to release some of the fear so that you can then stand in your power as you connect interdimensionally. So if you are someone who has a lot of fear about impending war or what's coming in the future, then look at that, heal that, trust that you are in the right place at the right time. All things happen in divine right timing. And you are more than just this physical structure. You are 
a divine being of light who is infinite. You are a spark of the divine. So um, back to your question, what you can do, you're, you're already doing it. And you're bringing on many other people who have uh, great messages to share on many different levels to help people to heal, to grow, to learn to stand in their power. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to something you said earlier about how, um, what humans can do to prepare and how we can shift into judgment and separation and what we can do to just be with that and release that, even if it's for 45 seconds. Uh, so here's a scenario. There's two people who are angry with one another. They cannot settle an impasse between them. They're just not seeing eye to eye on something. What advice do you have for healing this rift and for these two beings individually and synergistically to create something very different, very healing and loving to move so forward? So we would say start with yourself. So what is it that you want from this other person? What need do you have that you feel is not being met that you want this other person to kind of um, fulfill for you? And then you first have to do that by giving that energy to yourself. Maybe you feel like this person just doesn't hear you ever. They're not listening. They're not listening. Nobody ever listens to me. Are you listening to you? When your intuition is giving you messages, are you listening? Are you honoring your own needs? Are you saying, I'm going to do this thing and then you don't follow through? You're not listening to that first inner call because other people will be the mirror for you. So that's the first step is, is you needing to fulfill whatever it is you're asking somebody else to step up and be the mirror for. And then listening. What is it that that other person is really asking you for? Um, if you can just show up without judgment and keep an open mind, put yourself in your heart center first. So, you know, let us back up just a moment. Before you go into conversation, put yourself in your heart center. Think of something that makes you smile. You actually have two operating systems. This is what was required in order for you to play in density. You have the operating system of the ego mind, which is where all your programs of lack, limitation, and separation exist. And then you have the operating system of the heart, which allows you access to multi-dimensional information. So as you go throughout your day, you're moving back and forth between them. When you are present in the moment, you're in the heart center. If you're heart centered, you're present in the moment. Otherwise, you are projecting into the past or into the future, and you are not in the now. You're in a fear program. So as you come back to the heart centered space, what you'll find is that the things that seem like challenges to you, they immediately go away. All right. Or you find solutions because when you go into the heart centered space, you elevate your frequency. When you create a challenge, you also create the solution at the same time. There are two sides of the same coin in the dualistic universe. Everything has its polar opposite. So if you've got the challenge, you've got the solution. They're just in different resonances. When you're in the head, you're in the resonance of the challenge. So when you go back to the heart center, you are in solution energy. So first start by putting yourself in your heart center. Think of something that makes you smile and then ask you know, ask for support from your guides, set an intention, an alignment of energy that you, you know, uh, are working towards the highest outcome for yourself and all involved. And by the way, um, as you are working for your highest development, um, you, you are also working for the highest development of all others. They are not mutually exclusive. All right. So uh, they are intimately connected and the universe will always work for the highest benefit of all, as well as for yourself. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what we would say. Put yourself in the heart centered space and then listen, what are they really asking you for? And uh, you might be really surprised that the thing that they're asking you for is a thing that you want from them. You just have different ideas about how to get it. And if you're in that heart-centered space, you'll start receiving ideas and hits and inspirations about how to maybe find that solution energy. Love it. I want to take that same question globally and you nuance that a little bit. So here we are in earth global perspective as well. Two countries at war with one another. They do not see eye to eye and they have an impasse. 
And I would imagine as peaceful Pleiadians witnessing humanity, what can be done? I know that individuals often feel very powerless over this. How can we actually facilitate a global change from our being, our perspective? Some of it is a sense of woundedness and a sense of, of deservedness, uh, kind of a payback uh, for wrongs of the past. And so that wound has to be healed. And that that's true on both sides. Um, and the, the past really can't be changed. But what can you do moving forward so that each side is heard? And we do think there is a way through. But it's going to require letting go of the past and that those past hurts. And there's... Um, there is a division of uh, property, land, if you will, that is more equitable to all involved and that everyone's needs can be met. It's just going to have to, you, the old story is going to have to be released. And that will most likely require a third party, a neutral party to be the facilitator of that. There's so much, you know, remember what we said, you're in the middle of frequency wars. And there's a lot that's driving this. And it's not the day-to-day -day person. The day-to-day -day person wants peace. They want well-being for their family. They want food and shelter. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what side someone's on. These are basic things that they want. But then you've got the government and the powers that be and the manipulation that's been going on for thousands of years on your planet. And so the story, the narrative that keeps getting fed to people, and then people buy into the story, and it just perpetuates the issue. But when you see someone face to face and, and you see that they want the very same things that you want, um, it's hard to hold that energy. It's very hard to hold that anger and that resentment any longer um, because you see them in a very human, real way, as opposed to this caricature that is being portrayed. It's a story that is spun to elicit a specific emotional response. And that's that's part of the social conditioning that's been going on. Um, there are many people who, who have an awareness that, you know, you might say it's the cabal or the new world order, but there is a whole nother level of this with ET involvement that's been going on on your planet. And so that in and of itself is going to be a shock for, for many people who are very entrenched in their religious beliefs. Um, they're going to find that, that, their religions only hold half truths uh, and that there's a lot of ET involvement. Mm. You remind me as you share that, I once saw a documentary and it's still with me today. And in this documentary, they did an experiment with Palestinians and Israelis. They were young, they were children and they were teenagers. And they came in initially with everything you just described because they were raised with these kind of bias against one another, these kind of labels about what the other was. And through this experiment of spending time together, they formed these amazing bonds and friendships before they had to go to their side of the wall, so to speak. And that always stayed with me when humans can, as you said, get together face to face, the potential for healing, for love, for understanding. We truly are all one. We're brothers and sisters. It's enormous. And all these other pieces can fall away. They can fall away. The religion, the how I was raised, the what you do versus what I do, how you look versus what I look, how your sexuality is versus what mine is. All of these things that humans use. And it hurts my heart to say all of this, but we all use this to separate yes. from one another. Yes. It's incredibly unkind. Yes. And, you know, part of that is, is social conditioning. And then part of it is you all making um, a, a quick assessment of data that's in front of you in order for you to determine your safety. It's very primal. Am I safe in this context? And so you have prejudgments based off of history, things that are in the genetic line. You're running off of those programs. It's kind of a short shortcut, if you will, of assessing situations. But as you begin to release um, these limiting beliefs and you're living in that heart-centered space, you don't have to rely on those programs because when you're you're in the 
uh, the operating system of the mind, you had to rely on those programs because you couldn't access the heart. But when you're in the heart center space, you see the divine, you see, uh, you have access to all this information immediately. It is available to you and, and it is without judgment because you're in the heart center space. You, if you're in judgment, you can't be in the heart. If you're in the heart, you, um, you know, you're not in judgment. So it is, as you switch operating systems and you're living more from this heart centered space, you're, you are elevating above all of that genetic programming, all of the um, past life, future life programming, and you can simply be present with someone in their own divinity. Mm. Ah, yeah, that's so nice. Present with somebody in their own divinity. Even if they can't see it, you can. You can yeah. recognize it in them. And then you have compassion for them because they may not be able to see it in themselves. You have been to that dark place where they are. You have been through your personal struggles. So that allows you to access compassion in a way that honestly we cannot access in the higher realms. You access it in such an intense way because you know what it is like in physicality. And this is why we tell you compassion is your gift to the universe because even though we're in the ninth dimension and we have compassion for you, it doesn't hold a candle to what you can access, the intensity and the bandwidth of that frequency. It's it's quite remarkable. And that will have a ripple effect through the universe. So other civilizations, other um, galaxies where they may have had wars, it will help them to kind of open up. And you may be asking, well, how does that work? Um, think about it if somebody gives you a recipe to bake a cake. If you have never baked a cake before, you don't know how to do it. You don't know really where to start. You say, well, I, I think they use flour and eggs. So let's put some of that in. But you don't have the ratio. You don't know the procedure. And you just try to make it. It it It's a bit of a hot mess. But if somebody gives you the how-to, you can you can create it. Maybe it's not the perfect cake the first time, but you say, well, let's try it again, and you can create mastery with it. This is what happens as the signal is broadcast out. There are beings who now have the how-to. They've got the recipe, and it makes it much easier for them to tap into that energy themselves. Now, it's a bit like you with your computers, where someone may send you a file. doesn't mean that you have to open the file. You might just download it. And, you know, you might a year later go, oh, you know what? I forgot I had that on there. Let's look at it. So it's the same thing. It's, it is recorded in their energetic field and they may or may not choose to access it, but it, it will have a ripple effect through the entire universe and change the universal structure. When you talk about compassion, it reminds me of something, um, this is a book that you put together. You were channeled through Wendy Kennedy. It included uh, Tom Kenyon and put together through Martine Vallee. And you had a quote in there basically saying um, you, that you call Earth the planet of emotions because it's yeah. not like any other planet in the entire universe. Our range is so vast, these extreme highs and lows and everything in between and in other sectors of the galaxy, this emotional range is not as varied. And it reminds me, um, I once, I was having an experience and I got to experience an aspect of me, I'll say, I don't know if she was another dimension, past, future, but it was definitely me in a very different form here on this planet, but I was not earth person. I was quite tall and so forth. And I was mostly devoid of emotion, which I cannot tell you <laughs> is like a million degrees different than who I am. Debbie is very emotional. And so to experience that was frankly extraordinary. I loved her and I loved who she was as different as me. And I would like to experience more of that. And there's probably people listening going, oh, Maybe they were not, they acknowledge us earthlings because we're, we have this range of emotions and compassion, but wouldn't it be nice to be a little bit more steady and level as much as possible? Is that possible? Well, you, as you go back to this heart centered space, will begin to access what we call the high, is the high mind. Uh, this is the low mind that you're operating out of right now. And it's, it's how you operate in the 3d perspective. But the high mind is more like pure logic. 
and it's a bit more steady, if you will. So as you go into the heart-centered space, you access more of this pure logic. You still have emotion, but um, not quite in the same way that you're currently running a lot of those programs with the really high highs and really low lows. Because as you start to let go of your fears, what you find is those kind of normalize just a little bit. Um, and you tend to go kind of to the higher range of things, more joy, more passion, more excitement, more, more grace, more ease. Uh, and you don't travel down to the lower frequencies. Now, let us just say the reason that you have so many emotions here is because of all the genetic material that's been donated. Along with the genetic material uh, that was donated to the planet, you have all of the emotions and all the experiences that become available to you. So um, that's why you've got, you know, black, white, and a thousand shades of gray in between. And other planets, they might have six seven emotions, maybe. Um, if you look at Cassiopeia, Cassiopeia's archetype for that star for that um for that system is all about love, creativity, arts. And so their range of emotion is really geared towards that. Um, they're they're not exploring some of the denser, darker frequencies that you are. And so the fear that they experience or the, the anguish um, or the resentments, they don't go as deep into the extremes that, that you do because they're, they are, um, their big focus is really on beauty. So they have some lower ones, but, but not the way that you, you go to those energies. And, and that was just the game. That was the setup for that system. But here it was, it was really about pulling the archetypal patterns from all of these systems, things that hadn't necessarily been resolved in all of those systems and bring them to one planet to see if they can be worked out. This is why there's such a mixing of the planet. Now you had all of these different cultures and now they're all kind of blending together and that's really what's happening at the galactic level mm -hmm. and i want to get some clarity when you uh refer to this as the grand experiment called planet earth and how our dna was altered i've heard you say previously that there were five seed races who donated their genetic material to us and then i thought i heard you say earlier thousands of galactic races who donated genetic material, which is the it? planet. Yes. Uh, so you as humans, you have uh, five uh, seeds, uh, five races that have donated to the human genome. And then you've got um, thousands of worlds that have donated material for all the life on earth. So let's take um, your aquatic life. You barely have scratched the surface with that. Uh, to really discover what's living in your oceans. You can't travel to the depths that there are still are many creatures who are living there. And there are hybrid projects, uh, experiments that are going on with ETs where they're connecting with their genetic line. They may have donated genetic material. And so they may be learning something um, about themselves through work with these species. And then, you know, you may have other species like... Uh, spiders for example there are worlds uh where spiders were highly intelligent and quite large you know you're talking about eight foot tall if not taller beings and yet here on your planet you see something that is maybe a, a centimeter in in width and you all freak out <laughs> why is that because there is a part of you in the genetic memory that remembers the experiences of worlds where these dominant spiders, and they were a warring race, um, where they uh, they may have created war. Uh, you might have been uh, the victim to their perpetrator. And so that is lodged in the memory. And that's why you have such a vit visceral response to um, such a small little insect. Wow. Fascinating. Amazing. Okay. That was cool. I also really liked the information about these creatures under the sea that we don't even know about and who knows what's happening there. So, so much to explore. I want to continue with this DNA because it's very interesting to me. Um, so I want to relate it to human health issues and see if what I understand is correct and you can fill in the blanks here. 
So tell me if this is factual, that we went from an original 12 strand DNA as humans. And then when the Anunnaki had a catastrophe and lost their planet, they found earth to be habitable, came here, decided to make us slaves. And in order to do that, took humanity down to a two strand DNA. And then when humans were not doing well, health wise, women were not making it through childbearing, our, our years had gone down significantly in life, our health, our longevity. And then this is when our star brothers and sisters stepped in to gift us with some DNA. So the first question is, is anything that I just said accurate about our DNA, about that history? So, yes. Yeah, so, you know, you were originally designed with 12 strands of DNA. and um, you, there were beings who started in the fifth dimensional level and said, all right, I'll, I'll play along with this earth game and I'll come down in density. And so they did. And there were many high civilizations on your planet, several um, that rose and fell. Really about 400,000 years ago was the first appearance of we'll, we'll use the term Anunnaki, but also understand that that is a generic term. Um, it's, it, you know, the, the term itself is, is kind of, it would be like using aliens. All right. So, um, but who you think of as the Anunnaki, they were interacting with those on the planet, some of these higher civilizations and, um, and they were on Mars for quite a long time. Many of them around, um, the time of Atlantis, they were on Mars. And really those that um, were present on Atlantis were the last gatekeeper. Mm. That's the best way for us to say it. The last thing keeping them from planetary dominance. And once um, Atlantis started to go about 40,000 years ago, that's when they stepped in and, and they started altering humans a bit more and doing more genetic uh, alterations and monitoring. So at that point, um, you know, you kind of went through this dissension process as well. And, and there were those in Atlantis who knew this was coming. And so they hid some of those records, they buried some of the records, uh, and you're discovering, you're rediscovering some of this today, but there is also something very special about the sector of space that you're in. It is rich in photonic energy. And as a result of that, a lot of the planets in the solar system are undergoing their own transformation. So part of what gets thrown under the label of glo global warming it has to do with you moving through the sector of space. There's high photonic energy here. Your um, science can, can detect some of it, not all of it. All right. You don't have the instrumentation to recognize all of it. But for those of you um, who are old enough to remember what the sun really looked like, the light, the quality of the light, you will notice that it has altered. Some of that is because of the chemicals that have been sprayed in the sky. Not all of it. There's just simply more photonic energy and things are brighter because of this added energy as well. So, um, with this modification of the DNA, it was to keep you from accessing the divine light within you so that you could be controlled, so that you could be manipulated to do bidding, basically, a slave labor. And um, there were times when there were ETs on this planet who you interacted with in a very direct way you knew of your stellar origins. And then um, that information kind of fell out of your day-to-day -day awareness. All right. Some of your uh, aboriginals um, on different continents will remember this. It's in their oral traditions, but for the most part in Western civilization, in uh, tradi traditional Eastern cultures, that, that information has kind of um, been forgotten. And 
as you're moving through the sector of space, this photonic energy is also reactivating some of what has been dormant within you as you increase your frequency. Mother Earth, her pulse, if you will, her hertz that she resonates with or at is increasing. And because of this, uh, you are also getting instruction from her to increase your frequency, to match her. Uh, as you're going up in order to be vital, to be healthy. And this was the time that you were meant to do that. In Atlantis, there was an opportunity to grow and expand but and to kind of reach for higher highs. But the support of the sector of space that you're moving through wasn't there. So now is the time where you've got all this extra energy, this kind of uh, boost to help you. Think about it like a racetrack where you've got a start and a finish line. It's the same thing. There's, there's this band of light that would be your start or finish line. And rather than going uh, in a circle on the same plane, you're actually spiraling up, crossing uh, this vertical plane of light. And that helps you to release the past as you begin the next um, this next stage of development. So there were ETs who helped and some ETs um, had their own hybrid projects. And so, yes, they worked with individuals in, in um, sometimes in abducting, if you, if you want to use that word, in taking mother and in utero, altering the genetic material, adding some of their genetic material. Uh, so some of you are hybrids of sorts. Um and then some of you just carry the knowledge. You carry the knowledge and wisdom that has been put in your energetic field, memory. Sometimes it's from other lifetimes of your own. Sometimes it's your own guides who are supporting you and, and aiding you in making this information very readily available to you. Does that answer your question? Yes. I And I'm curious if I could take it a step further. And thank you for all of that. Our history is fascinating. Regarding the DNA, the extraction of the 10 strands, and then the contribution from the seed races. So how does that affect us now? And specifically, I'm asking things like cancer, things like um, arthritis or autoimmune situations. Is this part of our body's issue, if you will, with DNA? Or is this completely unrelated? Um, even without the other 10 strands of DNA, your body can be perfectly healthy. Really what it's about are your fear programs. Because your energetic template creates the physical structure. So when there's an imbalance in the energetic template, when you're holding judgment, that translates down to the cells. So the cell is not getting the full amount of energy that it should, because remember what we said before, you've cut off half of source energy. So it's not operating at peak performance and it may not be re reproducing properly. Um, you know, you've got corrupted copies of cells that get created. Uh, there's degradation that happens. Uh, you know, your telomeres are not staying as elongated as they could be. They're getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Uh, that is also a result of um, the lack of light, the lack of photonic light flowing through. And that was in part what was done to alter your genetic structure. So there is that aspect of it. And then there is the secondary aspect of your environment the chemicals that have been introduced into the environment. And because you are not vibrating at the highest levels energetically, your body isn't capable of readily processing those chemicals out. And frankly, some things you just wouldn't be drawn to eat or to, to drink. You might say, oh, you know, that doesn't look very good to me. Um, I want that over there. That looks really good. That, that's nice and organic and doesn't have chemicals on it. Um, you're, you automatically know that when you're in alignment with it and your body is much um, better able to process out the toxins. But when you've got the lower emotions and the lower thought forms in place that aren't allowing the body to function properly, it makes it, makes it very difficult. And if you just think about it this way, the way that your science already understands that 
when you are in a stress state, you're in that sympathetic nervous system, you're constantly in fight or flight and you're producing a different set of chemicals. When you go back to that heart centered space, you activate the parasympathetic, you put yourself into a rest and digest state so the body can heal itself. But, you know, most of the day you all are stressed out. You're thinking about all the things that you've got to control, all the things you've got to do in order to stay safe, to make money, to appear a certain way. Uh, there are, there's a lot of control that you're trying to exert in order to get a particular outcome instead of just allowing yourself to be divinely supported and being in flow. So that's the cause of a lot of the illness that you're seeing, this constant state of stress. Mm -hmm. Thank you. May I ask you two final questions? Yes. You have said before that each and every one of us has an amazing amount of support available to us in our world and also beyond the veil. And all we need to do is use it to call you. I didn't know if you meant euphemistically or literally call on literally. The yes. Or, ah, or your own guys. Cool. Yes. Both will help you. Okay. Awesome. We'll get ready. Cause <laughs> I will do that. I do a shamanic morning practice every day with my feet in the grass as the sun uh, sort of starts to come up outdoors. And I always am calling in my star brothers and sisters. Now, I love doing it because it feels important. How can I, any of us listening, how can we know that you hear us? What is the best way for us to communicate with you, with other star brothers and sisters? And what is the best way for us to receive your communication back to us? Well, each and every one of you has the ability to connect and to receive messages, to channel. It is not just a, a few unique few. You may not do it for your living. You may not do it uh, publicly for everybody, but you have the ability to do it nonetheless. Think of it like playing an instrument. You know, not everybody wants to be a concert pianist for for uh, their career, but they might do it for themselves for the joy of it. And so it is with channeling. So it's quite simple, the process. The difficult part is your mind and, and the limiting beliefs that pop up. So to do it, you want to ground, heart center yourself, ask a question because when you ask a specific question, it makes it much easier for your guides to give you information. Otherwise we're standing on the other side and you're saying, uh, what do I need to know? Well, there are a lot of things you need to know. So we have to kind of go through it all, weigh it all, see how the information we give, give you impacts your reality because, you know, we don't want to interfere. We don't want to give you information that is, is going to radically interfere with your growth process in a positive or negative way. That's for you uh, to discover the path for you to walk on your own. Um, so when you ask, we know that you are, you're ready for information. So we don't have to worry about interfering and then listen. And it might feel like your imagination at first, but we say, go for it. All right. Um, take what resonates, leave the rest behind. There are several things that we would also say that, that you all know when you're really honest with yourselves, when you are coloring the information to get the answer that you want. When something is really the truth, even if it isn't exactly what you want to hear, but it, it has a deep resonance with you, when you really check in and use your discernment, you know what the truth is. And we would say this even with your guides. You know, your guides may give you information, but if it doesn't resonate with you, let it go. Plain and simple. Your guides, you know, we on the other side, we have our own unique perspective based on our experiences. It is colored by the dimension that we are living in and our experience of reality as uh, we experience it. And then, you know, if you're listening to a channel such as Wendy, she's got to interpret the, the frequencies through her own experiences and put it into language for you. And then you are taking that information and interpreting it based on your programs. So there is always some coloring that is going on, but you've got to take what resonates with you. And if it doesn't resonate, let it go. If it's information that you need, it will find its way back to you. You'll hear it again and you'll say, oh, I've heard that before. Time to pay attention. Yeah. So we say, listen, and then ask for confirmation. Say, guides, I think this is what you're trying to tell me, but can I have some confirmation, please? So then 
you know, you might get it in repeated numbers or patterns. You might overhear the information spoken again in, in conversation and between two people in front of you in, in the line at the supermarket. All right. And if you say, hmm, I wonder if this is my confirmation, then take it as such because the thought would not cross your mind otherwise. Mm. Right. Yeah. Um, the other piece here we'd like to do if there's time, we'd like to do a very quick language of light activation that will help you open up to messages from your guides. Thank you so much. Yes. All right. So the language of light is sources language, and it's comprised of light, sound, sacred geometry, and cosmic information. So there are all these carrier waves that are included in what it is that you are hearing and experiencing. It's a bit like somebody playing a note on the piano so that you can reproduce the note. So as you experience the language, it speaks directly to you, the divine being of light. It is reminding you of frequency. And, you know, if somebody says, sing the note of C and you don't have perfect pitch, it's hard. But if somebody plays that note, you say, oh, that, okay, I can do that. Same thing with the language. You experience it and you say, oh, that frequency. I forgot that was available to me. Okay, now I know where to focus. And you can shift your energetic field. So it is a piece of spiritual technology. And that is what it is doing. That is, that is what it's helping you to do. It bypasses the traditional language centers of the brain. So, you know, it's the mind doesn't have to be involved. Remember, you're operating for the most part out of the ego mind, that low mind. And you want to access the high mind. The way the high mind is accessed is through the heart center first. So, uh, you know, you're, the soul understands. You don't have to figure any of this out. Like, what are they saying? There are many beings who will braid their energy with our own as we go. There are many galactics. And the reason they're coming in is because they are putting their own how-to into your field, all right? So how they work through that pattern, they're giving you that recipe that we talked about earlier. So it makes it much, much easier. So you might notice that the energy changes. You don't have to know exactly who it is because many times it's many, many beings who are braiding their energy together at once. All right, so enough said there. So relax, take a nice deep breath. We'll see where we go. Hala or ore mamane is a jude de menemiju, bidipidicat, but the bridge did in a maracata. He's a other de bidipidic, but the bridge did in a maracata. Menemine in the ala rabidibidiju de togora and bibide. Isana ara ashkotore in mahakatai in the ura menemiju de bakatai. He's a kata. Take a nice deep breath. We've got one more short round. Indo the way, but a bit of do we better in the day in the rabbit of Jukadi in the day jitata, a rabbit of Jukata, Hasa Katara, a mana ae, but do we be the bejicata, Hathana eler Jukadoi, Hithana uija, a moimoji, Igata, a rabbit of the Jukadai, Hisa anda cate, Hida or a minimum de Jukata, Ida e sacata, and bara ara cate, Hisa akata. And take another nice deep breath. And when you're ready, you can bring your presence back to the room. Mm. So there you have it, dear. Thank you. It is you're my very honor welcome. and pleasure to meet you and spend this time with you. And thank you for your generosity and your wisdom. It's been a great pleasure. And we'll just say one more thing here with the language of light. Typically, we recommend that you work with it three times a day for three days in a row. You don't have to come back and listen to the recording, although you can. You can also imagine connecting with this moment again. It's recorded in your energetic field. And what that does is it gives you um, an opportunity with three times a day for three days in a row to become familiar with the subtle energies so that you start to recognize it when it appears in your physical reality. So have fun working with it. Thank you so much for connecting with us, dear. We've had a, a real joy of a time being here. As always, we say, feel free to connect with us directly. You don't need Wendy. Ask your question, listen. And until we hear from you, we are around, we are watching, we are waiting, and we are sending many, many well wishes.
That was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I feel so shifted. Wow. (laughs) And that light language, mm, powerful stuff. Welcome back. How do you feel? I'm always a little spacey here for a couple yeah. minutes. <laughs> so I'm just coming back. I will bet. Well, then this is a great question for you, Wendy. How do you ground every day? Do you have any kind of a ritual that you perform or a practice to keep yourself in a great space on a daily basis? So I have a couple of things. Um, I do use some pieces of technology. I use grounding mats. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have some that I sit on and um, then I also work with crystals. So I usually have some form of crystal on me. If it might not in my pocket, then in a necklace or a ring or something like that. And that helps me to ground really any crystal will help you because it's of the earth. Um, but tourmaline obsidian, those are great. The guides often recommend Ruby as well. It's not mm-hmm. necessarily one that we think of for grounding, but it's one that they often recommend for it. Um, And then, you know, if I can try to get outside. That's wonderful. That's very informative. And last question to you, my dear, this is Dare to Dream. What are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Uh, I think just kind of bringing this message out in a bigger way Mm. um, and seeing where it goes. It's been quite a journey over the last 28 years. And it's amazing for me to see how it's changed in terms of people who are ready for information. It seems like now the things that we've been talking about, people are finally ready. So I'm excited to see kind of what unfolds with that and bringing the message out to a larger audience. Nice. Well, I hope to facilitate that for you as well. And for folks to reach you, higherfrequencies.net, is that the best place? That is it. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Pease. So deeply grateful for your time with us. This was extraordinary. Oh, thank you so much. It was such a joy to be here. I appreciate it. I end today's show with this quote, within you burns a brilliant light, illuminating the path to your dreams. Embrace the glow of your potential and let it guide you to extraordinary heights. The power to achieve lies within. Ignite your spirit and illuminate the world. Subscribe to this number one transformation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. If you're listening on a podcast platform, know that you can go to YouTube and see us live and in video, as well as on Spotify. And next week on the show, I'm excited to feature Matthew James Bailey. He is the founder and CEO of AIethics.world. I've heard this guy speak at least three times. He's going to bring a transformative conversation. He speaks about ethical AI and consciousness, and he is highly engaging and entertaining. Folks, thank you so much for joining us today on Dare to Dream. Post in the comments your takeaways and ahas, how you'll use this information you learned today going forward. And remember, turn all your dreams into your reality.